This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to easily and efficiently build and manage your own website. Hi everyone, I'm Flygon HG, and I love crime. So in this video, we're doing a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Soul Silver as a member of Team Rocket. In a Nuzlocke, if a Pokemon faints, it's dead forever, and I can only use Pokemon from evolution lines used by Team Rocket Grunts. Admin Pokemon are off limits. I know my place. The rest of the rules for this playthrough are shown here and in the description down below. But without any further ado, it's time to blast off at the speed of light. Surrender now or prepare to fight. My journey begins in the tiny town of Newbark. My mom has worked hard to give us a comfortable life here, but it's time for me to write my own destiny. Ever since I was a wee lad, I had but one dream, to become a member of Team Rocket. Sure, it's been years since the height of their power. After Giovanni disappeared, Team Rocket's been relatively dormant. But my boys on r slash rocket club seem to think that there's still some underground activity. If I turn over enough stones, I'm sure I'll be able to find them and join their ranks. But I can't just go walking around searching for a criminal terrorist organization in broad daylight. I need a cover story. So it's off to Professor Elm's lab to start my totally innocent, crime-free adventure to challenge the Pokemon League. Professor Elm gives me the choice of three starters, but none of them are on the Rocket Grunt approved list of encounters. Not sure why they limit our options so much, but I guess there's strength in uniformity or something. I just pick the evilest of the three starter options for now, but I'll be dumping him as soon as I get my first actual encounter. Before getting Pokeballs, I do have to do an errand for Professor Elm, and along the way I run into a fellow ne'er-do-well who's stolen a Pokemon from Professor Elm's lab. Nice. Stealing is definitely like a top five crime. When I get back to Elm's lab, the Popo asks me to rat out my new crime peer, but I'm no narc. I'll die before talking to the cops, that's for sure. Speaking of rats though, it's time to get my first Rocket Grunt approved team member, a Rattata from Sprout Tower who I named V. After training her up a bit, V and I head to the Dark Cave to catch our second eligible encounter, a Zubat. But we end up accidentally killing her with a tackle. Oops. Fortunately, there's plenty of other places to get Zubats, though now I will have to wait until after the first gym badge. But I can still head to Route 32 and catch an Ekans named Bumper. Even though she has Shed Skin instead of Intimidate, these two criminals will be more than enough to defeat Faulkner's Pigeons. I lead with a pre-poisoned V. Thanks to her Guts ability, she gets a 1.5 times boost to her attack stat when afflicted by a status condition. Unfortunately, V's still not strong enough to knock out Pidgey in one shot, but at least we get a flinch with Bite. So a second one takes him out, as we just have to take two ticks of poison damage. Pidgeotto is next, so I go for a quick attack. This does much less damage than I was hoping for, as a Guts plus poison damage brings V down to just 10 HP. So I gotta switch to Bumper on a second Gust. Pidgeotto starts going for Roost now though, and unfortunately Bumper is a bit outmatched here. I try to go for some para flinch hacks with Glare and Bite, combining it with a few defense drops from Leer, but Pidgeotto gets an untimely critical hit tackle, and Bumper soon falls. V is able to come in and close out the battle with a Bite, but I'm not super keen on losing one of my 8 possible encounters against the very first boss battle. If becoming a Rocket Grunt were easy, everyone would do it. There's no shame in starting over. On attempt 2, I managed to not kill the Zubat from Dark Cave, so this time around Sputnik has joined the squad. Sadly, V doesn't have guts on attempt 2, so Pidgey only takes about 60% from Bite. V2 also gets nailed by a billion sand attacks from Pidgey, causing him to miss a bunch of attacks, including several tail whips against Faulkner's Pidgeotto. The result is that Bumper once again faints before we can take out Pidgeotto. V dies here as well, so that's definitely another reset. Beating this guy Deathless has to be possible with these three Pokemon. Surely Team Rocket wouldn't limit me to just using a bunch of terrible Pokemon, so there must be something that I'm not seeing here. On attempt 3, I once again have a Gutsless Rattata. This time, we only get hit by one Sand Attack before taking out Pidgey. So even though we do still miss a few hits, V is able to lower Pidgeotto's defense once before having to switch out to Sputnik. After confusing Pidgeotto with Supersonic, it's off to Bumper, who has Intimidate this time around. I get luckier here than in the previous two fights, and Pidgeotto hits himself in confusion on the switch-in. A glare ensures we outspeed the monstrous bird, and a leer means that we should be able to outdamage Pidgeotto's roosts. So, a few turns later, and we've finally managed to defeat Faulkner and get the very first gym badge. On our way to Azalea Town, I run into none other than Team Rocket themselves, stirring things up in Slowpoke Well. 
It's my very first time seeing them in person, and I couldn't help but feel starstruck. I used to watch these guys on TV. For a little kid who loved crime, these guys were legends. I wanted nothing more than to join them and do crime. But try as I might, none of the grunts would listen to me. My cover story was just too convincing and they saw me as the enemy. Another commoner who failed to understand the art of doing crime. If they would just stop and listen, they'd see that I'm on their side. But since they won't, I'm forced to mow my way through each and every one of them. If I could just talk to someone higher up, maybe one of the executives, they might listen to me. Sadly, that doesn't seem to be the case with Executive Proton, but he and his level 8 Zubat and level 12 coughing are clearly small potatoes anyways. Surely one of the other executives will be more reasonable. I just have to bide my time. Speaking of time, if you could take just one second to subscribe to the channel, that'd help me out a lot. You might think you're subscribed, but you probably aren't, so go double check. Anyways, my next encounter with Team Rocket will have to wait a while, because next up is the fight against Bugsy, and that does not go well at all. I figured that Sputnik, with her quad resistance to Bug-type moves, would be able to take on Bugsy's Scyther with Wing Attack, but I was wrong. Wing Attack isn't a two-shot, and after a Leer, a critical hit Quick Attack is enough to one-shot Sweet Sputnik. V and Bumper go down soon after, and suddenly I find myself back at square one. It didn't feel like it at the time, but this wipe was sort of a blessing in disguise, because on attempt 4, V has the ability Guts and Bumper has the ability Intimidate. Still sucks to have to go through the first part of the game again, but these abilities will make the rest of our journey a bit easier, assuming that we don't once again wipe to Bugsy's unhuggable insect. This time, I used the limited amount of XP I have before the level cap to buff up Sputnik's defense by beating up Geodudes, but even then, it doesn't really matter. Scyther either gets a critical hit quick attack, or she doesn't. This time, she thankfully doesn't, so Sputnik lives, and Scyther falls. After easily disposing of Bugsy's Metapod and Kakuna, the second gym badge is ours. But now it's time to face off against one of the biggest Nuzlocke run-enders of all time, Whitney. Her metronome Clefairy and her stomp flinching mill tank are terrifying. With a level cap of 19, none of my Pokemon are able to evolve, but at the very least we can get two more encounters. From Ilex Forest I catch an Oddish named Vostok. Very few Rocket Grunts use this Pokemon, but it is in the handbook. I think it might be a slightly misguided attempt to recruit more women into Team Rocket. Unfortunately, Team Rocket is a very male-dominated organization. Anyways, I also catch a Drowsy from Route 34, who I name Apollo. He's one of just two non-poison-type encounters, which is pretty great, but he ultimately won't be all that useful until he evolves. A lonely nature is also really terrible. With my team of five aspiring crime doers, it's time to face off against Whitney. This is gonna require a bit of luck, and I'll definitely need to avoid some critical hits, but I did my best to swing the odds in my favor. For starters, I taught V the move Facade, which can be won as a TM at the Goldenrod City Department Store Lottery on Fridays. Combined with a status condition and guts, this gives V a 140 base power stab move off of plus one attack. It's more than enough to one-shot Clefairy. Unfortunately, it's not enough to one-shot Miltank, not even close, though we don't even get the chance to test that since Miltank goes for a tract and V succumbs to her utter beauty. This makes things a little bit harder. I decide to risk it and go for another return. Stomp doesn't kill V, but he's once again mesmerized by Whitney's Femme Fatale. I decide to switch to Bumper, who gets off an Intimidate as Miltank decides to go for Rollout. This is incredible because Miltank is now locked into Rollout, letting Bumper semi-safely hit her with a Glare. The second Rollout misses, which is a bit of a bummer, since Miltank has a Lumberry to cure the first Paralysis. But we luck out and we're able to get off a second Glare soon enough. From here, we just gotta get lucky and hope that Miltank doesn't get any critical hits. Most of my Pokemon know Protect, which is used to slowly stall Miltank out of Stomp. The main player for the rest of this fight will be Sputnik, who is reasonably bulky and can heal his HP with Roost. The annoying thing is that Sputnik is male, so I do have to switch out every now and then to shrug off a Trax. The entire ordeal takes about 16 minutes, and it does result in some close calls. Some very close calls. You might think that this all seems a bit overly complicated, but Miltank has Milk Drink, Whitney has two Super Potions, and my Pokemon are just too weak to reliably do all that much damage to her, even after getting off a Screech to lower her defense. So this was the only play I could find. Eventually though, Sputnik is able to paraflinch his way into getting a KO on Miltank, and the victory is ours. That wasn't exactly blasting off at the speed of light, but a W's a W. And to be fair, the speed of light is pretty fast. The only thing faster is how fast you can build your own website with the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. 
Squarespace is an online platform that helps you build and manage your own website, whether that's an online store for your business or a personal blog for your thoughts. I genuinely think that their all-in-one platform is the easiest way to quickly design professional and polished websites, especially when utilizing their customizable templates. For example, I use Squarespace's customizable templates to launch my very own website, poppyhg.com, the home of dozens of curated pictures of my corgi puppy, Poppy. I just updated the site, so go check out a brand new set of pictures. Squarespace also has a ton of other really useful features, like analytic information about the traffic of your website, the ability to add and play embedded videos directly on your website and Squarespace member areas, which can be used to connect with audiences and create exclusive members-only content. So if you're looking to start a website for your business or hobby, then you should absolutely check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, you can use my custom link to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the challenge. With the Miltank wall successfully conquered, my team celebrates the win with an evolution parte. V evolves into Raticate, Bumper evolves into Arbok, Sputnik evolves into Golbat and then soon after into Crobat, Vostok evolves into Gloom, and Apollo evolves into… nothing. He has to wait a little longer, but he was still invited to the party. In Ekrateg City, I make my way into the basement of the Burn Tower and catch my sixth eligible team member, a coughing. I name him Pioneer. An adamant nature kind of sucks because my plan for him is to just spam Flamethrower and Thunderbolt, which I can pick up from the Goldenrod game corner, but it's still nice to finally have a full team of six. Though that's not particularly relevant against the fourth gym leader Morty, who gets completely swept by V. That's right folks, it's time for round three of Rat Power. Now that he's fully evolved, Guts Facade hits for truly disgusting amounts of damage. Though against Morty, I do have to use Crunch, so we're only seeing a fraction of V's true potential. All in due time, though. With the fourth gym badge obtained, the level cap is high enough for Apollo to evolve into Hypno. Not exactly a party this time around, but it's still cause for celebration. In Cyanwood City, Apollo has his first real show of strength against Chuck's fighting types. I'm shocked to see that he manages to outspeed and one-shot Primate with Psybeam. So second and last is Polyrath. If Apollo had the ability Insomnia instead of Forewarn, which is totally useless, this would be all but wrapped up, but since he doesn't, Polyrath can prolong things by putting us to sleep. I decide to stay in and hope for an early wake up, but I guess using Psybeam twice exerted a lot of energy, and Apollo takes a full three turns of sleep. So I have to switch to Vostok on a Surf. I haven't evolved him yet because I'm waiting to gain a few important moves that Vileplume doesn't have access to. I could potentially evolve him into Blossom as well, but Vileplume seems like the more Team Rockety of the two choices. Anyways, this takes a few more turns because Chuck heals, but eventually Vostok literally drains the life out of Polyrath with a few Mega Drains, winning us the fifth gym badge. Now it's off to the Lake of Rage to catch a Venonat, another one of the less commonly used Rocket Grunt Pokemon. Viking has Compound Eyes, which will turn into Shield Dust instead of Tinted Lens when he evolves. Bummer. At the Lake of Rage, I also run into the champion of the Pokemon League, Lance. He's babbling about investigating some mysterious radio signals coming from a souvenir shop in Mahogany Town, and I agree to help him out because I don't want to be rude, but I really couldn't care less about whatever this goody two-shoes is going on about. I reluctantly make my way to the souvenir shop, ready for whatever silly romp this cape-wearing nerd wants me to help out with, only to watch Lance point-blank murder a man with his Dragonite. I mean... Like, I like crime as much as the next guy, but I draw the line well before blowing a man's face off with hyperbeam. What the fuck, man? I mean, I kinda gotta go with whatever Lance's plan is now, huh? So as we head down to the secret staircase, my heart drops as I realize where I am. This is the infamous Rocket Hideout. I'm raiding Rocket Hideout. So I've basically got two options. One, help Lance bring down Team Rocket, the criminal organization that I myself want to join. Or two, come clean and have Lance's Dragonite blast a watermelon-sized hole through my chest. If there's one thing I love more than Team Rocket and crime, it's not dying. So I guess I'm going with option one. This sucks, man. If I somehow do make it into Team Rocket, all these guys are gonna hate me. It's gonna be really hard to make friends. Eventually, though, I run into Executive Ariana. Fanboying aside, she's one of Team Rocket's top officials. Surely she'll understand and be able to keep me safe from Lance if I just tell her the truth of what's going on. But before I can get out a word, Lance shows up to save the day, and suddenly I find myself in the middle of a multi-battle against Executive Ariana. Which sucks! 
She's never gonna listen to me now after I help Lance kill her Pokemon. The battle kicks off with Lance's Dragonite going for a fly, and Apollo taking out Ariana's Arabok with a Psybeam. The Rocket Grunt's Drowsy then hits a Hypnosis to put Apollo to sleep as Ariana brings in Murkrow, which is actually really bad. Ariana's Murkrow knows Pursuit, so I can't switch out without the move doing double damage to Apollo. I know that if Ariana knew who I was, she wouldn't try to kill Apollo, but since she doesn't, my only hope of making it out of this fight without losing Apollo is the same schmuck that roped me into this whole fiasco in the first place. On the next turn, Dragonite kills Drowsy, which is not helpful at all. Apollo takes his first turn of sleep, and then Murkrow nails us with a pursuit. It looks like we would have been safe from a non-critical hit if we switched, so I probably should have just gone for it. But now, even a non-crit looks like it'll kill us if I decide to switch. So please, Lance, just kill the Murkrow. Lance might be the biggest asshole I've ever met. Never mind the fact that he coerced me into fighting one of my childhood idols, resulting in the death of one of my beloved teammates, who is also my only team member that resists psychic attacks, he manages to out-asshole all of that with this little gem. Sorry, Motti. I saw how well you were doing, so I just hung back. I guess life isn't all that precious to a man who goes around murdering small business owners. As I'm left to mourn the death of Apollo, I realize that I'm almost certainly blacklisted by Team Rocket now. Really a rough day all around. But maybe there's still one hope. Ariana may be number two in charge, but there is one person ahead of her, Executive Archer. If I can talk to him and explain the whole situation, then maybe, maybe he'll let me join and Apollo's death wouldn't have been in vain. First though, I got a Smackdown Price in his three Pokemon with facades from V. That right there is Red Power. But we're obviously not facading our way through Jasmine's Steel types. Instead, it's up to Pioneer, who has now evolved into Weezing. Flamethrowers torch her two Magnemides, and even though Steelix survives with a sliver from one Flamethrower, she just sets up Sandstorm and then goes down on the following turn. With seven gym badges, it's time to head to Goldenrod City and track down Archer. In the underground, I run into a fellow Grunt, who gives me the greatest gift I could have ever asked for my very own Team Rocket outfit. It fits perfectly and I've never felt more comfortable in my own skin. I could walk around like this for hours, but unfortunately if I try to leave the city, I'm stopped. That's fine though, I'll have plenty of time to roam Johto in my actual uniform once I've officially joined Team Rocket. Archer is waiting for me at the top of Radio Tower. As I go to approach him, he doesn't give me a chance to speak, but I get it he still sees me as the enemy. Hopefully, by beating him in battle and showing him how strong of a trainer I am, he'll hear my piece and offer me a spot in Team Rocket. Who knows, maybe he'll even make me an executive. I'd like to say that my battle with Archer was a memorable one, but he too gets completely swept by guts-boosted facades from V. My first order of business as an executive will be to give every member of Team Rocket a guts radicate. We'll be unstoppable and the world will be ours to do as much crime as we want. Unfortunately, as the dust on the battlefield clears, Archer doesn't give me a chance to speak. Instead, he says the last thing I would have ever expected. He says that Team Rocket is done. I'm crushed. All I've wanted to do for as long as I could remember is to be a member of Team Rocket. And somehow, instead of joining them, I've caused them to disband. I've destroyed everything I've ever wanted, and now I have nothing. How did this happen? What did I do wrong? As I stared into the sparkling sea, playing back the events that got me here, the answer became perfectly clear. It wasn't my fault. I didn't do anything wrong. It was that murderous bastard's fault. He ruined my life. So now, we're gonna go kick his ass. And there's nothing I do better than revenge. But I'm still getting revenge as a rocket grind. So before continuing on with my journey, I head to the safari zone and catch the final eligible encounter of the run, a grimer named Juno. She'll be important in a second, but for now, the 8th gym leader Claire is next. V is eager to tear through her team with guts boosted facades, but her lead Gyarados with Intimidate makes that a little harder. So I lead with Vostok, who's able to underspeed and hit Gyarados with a Sleep Powder. He ends up missing the first Sleep Powder despite holding a Zoom Lens, but Gyarados just goes for Dragon Rage twice, so we're safe to fire off a second one. This then gives V a completely safe switch in on Gyarados' first turn of Sleep. And from here, it's Sweep City, Population V. Claire's Dragonairs and Kingdra are all outsped in one shot by Guts Facade. 
That was a fun appetizer, but the Elite Four and Lance are the main course, and that's where we're headed next. With the new level cap of 47 to match Karen's Houndoom, I finally evolved Vostok into Vileplume after he's learned Giga Drain. I also decided to bring Juno the Muck onto the team in place of Viking the Venomoth. Without Tinted Lens, Viking's not nearly as useful, so he'll be sitting this one out. The rest of my team is ready to go though, so let's go get our sweet, sweet revenge. First up is Will, and thankfully all five of his Psychic-type Pokémon are able to be one-shot by Guts Boost and Facades from V. And it's a good thing too, because otherwise, without Apollo, his Psychic-types would be a huge issue for my team. That's one Elite Four member down, let's keep him coming. Koga's next, so it's time for Juno's debut. She's able to one-shot his Ariados with a Flamethrower before the Creepy Spider can do anything too scary. Venomoth comes in next and hits us with a Psychic for a solid chunk of damage before he too goes down to a Choice Specs Flamethrower. Same thing happens to Fortress, who's third. Crobat tries to make things annoying by going for a double team, but Juno connects with a Flamethrower anyways, and then I can bring Sputnik in for a mirror match. We know Aerial Ace and Roost, so after a few turns, Koga's Flimsy Flyer goes down, leaving him with just his Muck. This Muck is holding Black Sludge, which is basically leftovers that only works for poison types. It's an item that'll be pretty handy for the rest of this playthrough, so I'm gonna try and steal it from him. The issue is that Muck has the ability Sticky Hold, which prevents items from being stolen. So I have to bring Bumper in and first hit Muck with a Gastro Acid to suppress his ability. He hits us with a Screech in Retaliation to lower our defense, so I decide to switch out. I'm not trying to lose Bumper to a critical hit Gunk Shot, which Muck does get against Juno for a massive chunk of damage. A few turns later, I'm able to get Bumper back in and eventually connect through all of Muck's minimizes with a Thief. The Black Sludge is ours, so now it's just a matter of taking out Muck. His only attacking move is Gunk Shot, which only has 5 PP, so it's usually not too difficult to stall him out. Though he does manage to get a second critical hit against Pioneer, which almost cleanly knocks him out from full HP, as well as a third critical hit against Bumper on his fifth and final Gunk Shot. This Muck came to play, but in the end, it wasn't enough. With Gunk Shot stalled out, Sputnik can finish him off with a few Aerial Aces, and finally win us the battle. Next up, Bruno. I lead with Sputnik into his Hitmon top. A single fly is enough to get a clean one-shot, bringing Onyx in second. So it's off to Vostok, who takes him out with a Giga Drain a few turns later. That brings in Hitmonlee next, so I switch to Pioneer on a Blaze Kick that misses. We trade off Fire-type attacks for a few turns, until I decide that it's better to switch back to Sputnik. Aerial Aces take him and his punching compatriot out on the following turns. That just leaves Machamp. So I switch to Vostok on a Revenge, which is a weird choice because this Machamp knows Rock Slide. Fortunately, he also has the ability No Guard, which means our Sleep Powder is guaranteed to hit. Then we take him out with a few Giga Drains and Sludge Bombs, winning us the battle against Bruno. Last for the Elite Four is Karen, so it's again time for Vostok to take the stage. Her Umbreon gets pancaked by a Facade. Easy. Gengar comes in next, but we outspeed and switch to Crunch now, which also gets the one-shot. Houndoom goes down to a facade as well, but fourth for Karen is Murkrow, and since she knows Sucker Punch, I decide to deal with her by bringing in Pioneer. On the switch, she ends up just going for Pluck, but it's better to be safe than sorry. Pioneer kills Murkrow with a Thunderbolt, and then also torches Vileplume with a few flamethrowers, winning us the battle against Karen and defeating the Elite Four. So at long last, it's time to seek our revenge against Lance. The issue is that his three Dragonites are really, really scary. I mean, we already saw what one of them can do to a man's face. The smell of burning flesh is not easy to forget. My best bet is to try to take them out with Rat Power. But once again, a lead Gyarados with Intimidate makes that a bit difficult. And unlike Claire's lead Gyarados, Lance's has Ice Fang, which could crit and kill Vostok before he can get off the 75% accurate sleep powder. Not to mention that it can also cause Freezer Flinch. So instead, I decide to lead with Sputnik. By giving him a lagging tail, I can move after Gyarados and use U-Turn to bring V in for free. Sputnik is bulkier than Vostok, so even a critical hit wouldn't kill him. And with his inner focus ability, he's immune to flinch. So the only way that this doesn't work is if Ice Fang freezes. Lance really is an asshole. Well, at this point, I decide that my best bet is to hope that Sputnik unfreezes before he goes down, but sadly he doesn't and he dies as a bat-shaped popsicle. That's about as bad of a start as you can have, but one way or another, V does get to come in for free and cleanly kill Gyarados with a guts-boosted facade. So Lance's first of three Dragonites comes in next. This is his level 51 and therefore the bulkiest. 
Even with the 20% boost via a held silk scarf, facade is a roll to kill here, so we're gonna need to get a little lucky. V out speeds to hit a facade. But it looks like we've finally found the limit of Rat Pop. Oh, oh, uh, my, my mistake. Sorry, sorry for your loss. As V goes down, so too does my last hope of winning this battle and of getting my revenge. Bumper is able to come in and thanks to a choice scarf, we can kill the level 50 Dragonite with an Ice Fang, but there's still two more Dragonites left and a Charizard and an Aerodactyl. I just don't think we have enough resources to be all four of Lance's remaining Pokemon. His Dragonites won't get one shot by Ice Fang, it's just not strong enough of a move without Stab, and I'm pretty sure a Dragon Rush will cleanly kill Bumper. But just as I'm ready to accept defeat, Bumper manages to land a critical hit Ice Fang into Lance's first Dragonite, and suddenly I feel a warm glow from a tiny spark of hope. Dragonite number 3 is next, and although he doesn't fall to a single Ice Fang, a Dragon Rush in retaliation leaves Bumper with just 15 HP. So just like that, all three of Lance's Dragonites are down, and that spark is quickly growing into a steady flame. Charizard comes in next, so it's off to Juno. She's bulky enough to be able to shrug off a Dragon Claw on the Switch. She gets hit a bit harder by a critical hit Shadow Claw, but we still have plenty of HP left to retaliate with a Thunderbolt, which paralyzes Charizard, meaning that we can outspeed and take him out on the next turn. Someone call the fire department because that spark of hope is now a full-blown wildfire. Aerodactyl is last, so it's off to wheezing on a pretty nasty rock slide. That damage means that a single critical hit or flinch will seal our fate even with Protect and Black Sledge recovery. Another Rock Slide connects into Pioneer, but we survive the hit and safely fire off a Thunderbolt. We just need one more hit. After our recovery turns, another Rock Slide connects, and Pioneer zaps the winged beast out of the sky, winning us the battle against Lance and becoming champions of the Pokemon League. Revenge tastes oh so sweet, even if it did come with a price. But in my elated state, it dawned on me. My personal revenge might be over, but why stop there? I can't bring Team Rocket back, but I can get revenge on the person who forced them to disband in the first place all those years ago. The person that made Giovanni go underground and ultimately made Team Rocket so structurally weak that their entire organization could be crumbled by a single botched job in Goldenrod City. I'm gonna hunt down the most powerful Pokemon trainer in the world, Trainer Red. But in order to do that, of course, I need to clear through the gym leaders of Kanto. And after the losses against Lance, I only have five Pokemon to do it with. Normally, I play through Kanto with a single level cap to match Blue's Pidgeot, but at the start of this challenge, I decided that I'd try to do every single Kanto gym leader in level cap order. Kinda regretting that now, but I'm not one to back down from a challenge, especially after we've come so far. A lot of the gym leaders are pretty easy, despite our shattered team. Janine is mostly swept by Psychics from Viking, Lieutenant Surge is mostly swept by Earthquakes from Bumper, Brock is completely swept by Giga Drains from Vostok, and Misty is also swept by Vostok, this time by a combination of Sunny Day, Chlorophyll, and Solar Beam. But the 13th gym leader is Sabrina and her Psychic types, which are a massive issue for my now Mono Poison type team. She only has three Pokemon, but all three of them are very fast and very strong. An easy answer would be Crunch with Bumper, but she needs to be holding a Choice Scarf to outspeed Sabrina's Pokemon, and her attack IV is a little too low to be able to get one-shots on all of them. Similarly, Viking knows Signal Beam, but needs to be holding Choice Specs to ensure one-shots, and a Choice Scarf to outspeed Alakazam. If Viking could learn Bug Buzz before the ridiculously high level of 59, this wouldn't be an issue, but alas. So going into this battle, I'm prepared for this to be a wipe, and one that could have been avoided by not letting Apollo go down against Ariana. The plan I go with is to lead Viking into Sabrina's Espeon. With the Choice Specs, we can outspeed and kill Espeon with a Signal Beam. This brings in Mr. Mime next, Sabrina's weakest Pokemon. So I switch to Juno on a nasty Psychic, and as you can see from that damage, any critical hits or special defense drops here means that I'm totally done for. But by surviving that one, I can start using Protect, Disable, and Minimize to stall Mr. Mime out of her Psychic BP. There's only 10, and Mr. Mime helps things along by going for moves like Light Screen and Mimic. But every time Mr. Mime fires off a Psychic, I hold my breath and pray that it doesn't connect and kill Juno. 
Miraculously, we do successfully stall Mr. Mime out of her psychic PP, which means that I'm free to switch in Bumper, who can set up a substitute that will keep her safe from Alakazam for the one turn needed to take her out with a Black Glass's boosted crunch. However, there is one wrinkle that I didn't account for. After Mr. Mime runs out of Psychic PP, she starts randomly using her other three moves, one of which is Skill Swap. This causes us to switch abilities, which gives Mr. Mime Intimidate and lowers Bumper's attack, meaning that she will now no longer kill Alakazam with a single crunch. So I actually have to also stall Mr. Mime out of her Skill Swap PP. But after that, I'm able to successfully set up a substitute and kill Mr. Mime with a crunch. And then finally, Alakazam comes in, breaks our substitute with a Psychic, and falls to a crunch. What a relief. I genuinely did not expect to win that battle. As a result, I'm feeling pretty good as we go into these last few gym battles. Erica is swept by Sludge Bombs from Vostok for the 14th gym badge, but then against Blaine, I make a miscalculation, and Pioneer gets killed by a nasty overheat from his ace Rapidash. That really sucks, but after Rapidash landed a critical hit Flare Blitz against Juno, I had nothing that was going to tank that overheat any better. Rest in peace, Pioneer. Your smelly presence will be missed. As we go to face off against the final gym leader of Kanto, I'm down to just four Pokemon. Blue leads with Exeggutor, and I lead with Viking. Now that he's at level 60, he knows Bug Buzz, which cleanly takes out the Psychic-type Palm Tree. Arcanine comes in next, and this thing is a total beast. My only option is to go for a Blind Sleep Powder, which mercifully connects. Time to hope for some good sleep turns. I switch to Bumper to get off and Intimidate as the terrifying dog does snooze for one more turn. A Choice Scarf lets Bumper outspeed and hit an Earthquake, which obviously doesn't kill. So Arcanine wakes up and lands a nasty Flare Blitz, but the Intimidate saves Bumper from becoming Roadkill. The Recoil causes Blue to heal, but then two Earthquakes are more than enough to finish off our fluffy foe before he can kill my Cobra. Third is Rhydon, so I switch to Vostok on a really nasty Earthquake but thankfully we avoid the critical hit, meaning that we can retaliate with a Giga Drain for the one-shot. That gets us back to full HP as Pidgeot comes in next. Somehow, this is another tough nut for us to crack. I switch to Juno on an Air Slash. By using Protect and Leftovers, I can heal back a good amount of HP between hits, but Return still does a huge chunk of damage. I decide to try to set up some minimizes to tilt the odds in my favor a bit. We go back and forth for a few turns, but eventually Pidgeot uses Whirlwind, which frustratingly brings out Sputnik. I've been using him to fly around the map, and I just completely forgot to put him back in the box before starting this fight. This is a bit awkward. I assume that he'll just get outsped and die to a return, and there won't be that much harm done, but we actually outspeed, you know, because Sputnik is a crowbat, which means I get off a U-turn. This is super dumb because it means Juno takes a massive amount of damage on the switch from a return. And it puts Pidgeot into healing range, which Blue gets to do for free because I foolishly clicked Protect on the next turn. At this point, it's starting to look like I might lose this because I forgot to put Crobat in the box. What a way to go. A few turns later and I find myself in the red, staring down Pidgeot also in the red. I assume that Juno is just going to go down here, along with my chances of winning the battle. But then we outspeed and kill Pidgeot with a gunk shot, meaning that for some reason Blue was going for Whirlwind. That's complete nonsense, but I'm going to roll with it. Arceus gave me a chance to win this battle deathless. Machamp is fifth, so I switch to Vostok on a dynamic punch. Then it's off to Viking, who has Soul Silver's one accessible Focus Sash still intact. Thanks to No Guard, we can guarantee connect with the Sleep Powder on the next turn. So now, it's time for Sleep Roulette Round 2. Two Psychics will be enough to kill Machamp, but Machamp gets the brutal one-turn sleep and wakes up to kill Viking with a Stone Edge on the next turn. And then there were three. Vostok comes back in, free from confusion, and finishes off Machamp with a single Sludge Bomb. But last for Blue is his Dragon Dancing Gyarados. He's also got Ice Fang, which I know all too well can be a huge issue. But Vostok has been incredibly clutch since he's evolved into Vileplume, and he continues to be clutch here. Despite losing an important speed tie on the second turn, Vostok survives two hits from Ice Fang, and two Sludge Bombs are enough to take out Gyarados and win us a brutal fight against Blue for the 16th and final Gym Badge. But with just three Pokemon left, there is no chance that I'm beating Red. This feels hopeless, though I guess it's not technically over until all of my Pokemon are dead and in the ground. If we're gonna go down, at least we'll go down fighting. As I head to face off against Red, I make sure to change the date of the game to October 10th so that the hail on top of Mount Silver is replaced with Diamond Dust. 
This means that I'll be able to actually recover HP with leftovers in Black Sludge. And also, Red's Lapras, Snorlax, and Blastoise won't have perfectly accurate blizzards. But that's basically all I can do to swing the odds in my favor. It's time to end this challenge one way or another. Red leads with his Pikachu that generously lets me level up my Pokemon to the level cap of 88. I lead with Bumper, who is able to outspeed and one-shot Pikachu with a Choice Scarfed Earthquake. That brings in Leprod next, so I hard switch to Vostok on a Psychic. It goes without saying, but I can't play around critical hits here. Or really any bad RNG for that matter. A Choice Specs Giga Drain leaves Lepra with a sliver, but does get us back to full HP, meaning that we can barely survive a Blizzard in retaliation. Red heals, but that's actually great because it means that we can Giga Drain again, getting Vostok back to almost full HP. And then a third Giga Drain takes out Lepra's last tick of health. Charizard time. I switch to Juno, who gets hit by a Flare Blitz, which crits. That's really bad, but with Leftovers Recovery, maybe we can survive another hit. Juno does indeed survive a follow-up, and then thanks to all that Flare Blitz recoil, Charizard falls to a single Rock Slide. So it's now a 3 vs 3, though Juno is obviously pretty much out of commission. But looking at my resources, I decide that I do need him alive for the safe switch later. So it's off to Bumper, who gets off an Intimidate as Snorlax goes for a soft crunch. Then we start trading off attacks. Poison jabs from Bumper and blizzards from Snorlax. I have no idea why he's going for Blizzard instead of Giga Impact, but maybe the AI doesn't want to take the turn of Recharge or something? Whatever the reason, it means that Bumper the Arbok is miraculously able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Snorlax and make it out alive. This has been a Hall of Fame performance from Bumper, and suddenly we now have the edge on Red, 3 vs 2. Red's remaining Pokemon are Blastoise and Venusaur, both of which can be moderately dealt with by Vostok using Giga Drain and Sludge Bomb respectively. But because of his choice specs, we'll need to be able to switch him in and out, which will require some sacrifices. So I switch in Juno, expecting him to take one for the team. But Blastoise goes for Blizzard, which doesn't kill Juno. This is huge because it means that I have a chance to stall Blastoise out of some more Blizzard PP, which will give me a better matchup with Vostok. But it's actually even better than what I was expecting, because Blastoise misses his next Blizzard, which lets Juno set up a Minimize. And then, even though the next Blizzard does connect, it also fails to kill Juno after all the leftovers recovery. So, by the time Blastoise is fully out of Blizzard PP and going for Hydro Cannon, we've gotten up to Minimizes, which is enough to dodge another attack and hit Blastoise with a Gunk Shot. And then, Blastoise misses another attack, though it was Focus Blast, so, I mean, come on. But this means that Juno nails him with a second Gunk Shot, which does leave him with a Sliver, but also gets the Poison, meaning that Blastoise falls and Red has just one Pokémon left a Venusaur that cannot hit Juno for even neutral damage. That Blastoise had the worst performance I have ever seen from a single Pokemon. The Hall of Fame of Sucking has an entire wing dedicated to this Blastoise. All of a sudden, Juno, meant to be a sacrifice for a safe switch into Vostok, has clawed her way back from near death, defeated Red's Venusaur, and won us not only the battle against Red, but the entire freaking run. That was such a fun playthrough. I honestly did not expect to win that final battle. But it just goes to show you, if you want revenge badly enough, then anything is possible. That's a good lesson to take away from this story, right kids? Well, that and that doing crime is cool. Quickly kids, before your parents catch on, go do a crime. Go do as much crime as possible. Team Rocket will rise again. Mark my words, Team Rocket will rise again.